right, well, good morning, everybody, and happy Easter. Yay. It's okay to celebrate, too. All right. Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to Encounter. I'm so excited that you guys are here to worship with us today. Uh, whether you've been here before or this is your church home or it's your first time, uh, we just want to say welcome, and we're so excited that you decided to spend Easter here and worship with, uh, with us this morning. I want to invite you to stand up and just uh, say hello to somebody this morning. Tell them Happy Easter uh, before we get started worshiping together today. As we uh, begin worship this morning, a lot of times on Easter, there's just this great expectation. There's this great pressure. And yes, it's a big day. It's, uh, it's maybe the most important day in all of history. Um, but there's just a lot of expectation. And it almost just feels like we have to do more or work a little harder than normal or just be something that we normally aren't on a Sunday. And so I just want to invite you uh, this morning to just let all that fall off because your Savior, our risen King, has done the work. And so we just get to celebrate and enjoy it this morning. So that's what I want to invite you to do. That's what we're going to do up here as we sing and as we worship. Um, and we're going to sing these words here in just a second as we cry out and sing, uh, let every knee bow before the King of Kings. Let every tongue confess that He is God. So can we, can we cry out in unity this morning? and worship our King together. Let's sing this together. I, I invite you to sing with us as we worship this morning. So let every knee come bow before the King of Kings. Let every tongue confess that He is Lord. Lift up your shout. Come join with all of heaven singing holy. Let's sing that again. So let every knee, so let every knee come bow before the King of Kings. Let every tongue confess that He is Lord. Jesus is 
is enough for me oh the blood of jesus is enough and this is all my hope and peace nothing but the blood of jesus and this is all my righteousness nothing but the blood of jesus and oh precious is the flow that makes me white as snow But the blood of Jesus, what can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Thank Him for His blood this morning. Jesus, we love you. Thank you so much for your sacrifice. so good that we get to sing from victory this morning not having to work not having to earn but just accepting what Jesus has done let's sing this together see how great the chasm that lay between us how high the mountain I could not climb in desperation to heaven and spoke your name into the night and through the darkness your loving kindness soar through the shadows of my soul the work is finished the end is real
has no claim on me. Let's sing that out this morning. Then came the morning that sealed the promise. The unburied body began to breathe.
There's no more appropriate place that we can be at than at the foot of the cross this morning. As we sing that we surrender our lives, we realize that Jesus surrendered his life for us on the cross this morning. So I just pray this morning that the Holy Spirit is moving in your heart. I pray that this morning as we worship, as we sing, and as we declare in unity the majesty of King Jesus, that this is not just another Easter. This is not just a another year. But that today it would sink in with a sense of hope, with a sense of awe that maybe none of us have ever experienced before. Whether this is your first Easter you've ever celebrated, or you've done this since you were a child, I just want us to sing that chorus again. As we really think about what it means to surrender our life to the King that surrendered His life to us. Let's sing that together. Sing at the cross, at the cross, I surrender my life. I'm in all of you. I'm in all of you. Where you love ran red and my sin washed white. I owe all to you. I owe all to you. that we have in you. We thank you that you're a God that's not still in a grave, not still in a tomb, but that's here with us right now in our midst, speaking to us, moving among us. So Jesus, we just welcome you more and more. We just say, have your way. We love you. It's your name that we pray. Amen. Y'all can have a seat. scripture reading comes from 2 Kings 4, 32-36 and Luke 24, 1-12. When Elisha reached the house, there was the boy lying dead on his couch. He went in, shut the door on the two of them, and prayed to the Lord. Then he got on the bed and lay on the boy, mouth to mouth, eyes to eyes, hands to hands. As he stretched himself out on him, the boy's body grew warm. Elisha turned away and walked back and forth in the room. And, th- and then got on the bed and stretched out on him once more. The boy sneezed and seven times and opened his eyes. Elisha summoned Gehazi and said, Call the Shun- Shunammite. And he did. When she came, he said, Take your son. She came in, fell at his feet, and bowed t- to the ground. Then she took her son and went out. On the first day of the week, very early in the, sp- in the morning, The woman took the spices they had prepared and went to the tomb. They found the stone rolled away from the tomb, but when they entered, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were wondering about this, suddenly two men in clothes that gleamed like lightning stood beside them. In their fright, the women bowed down with their faces to the ground, but the men said to them, Why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here. He has risen. Remember how he told you, while he was still with you in Galilee, the Son of Man must be delivered over to the hands of the sinners, be crucified, 
and on the third day be raised again. Then they remembered his words. When they came back from the tomb, they told all these things to the eleven and to all the others. It was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, mother, Mary the mother of James, and the others with him who told this to the apostles. But they did not believe the woman, because their words seemed to like to them like nonsense. Peter, however, got up and ran to the tomb. Bending over, he saw the strips of linen lying by themselves, and he went away, wondering to himself what had happened. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. How are y'all doing? Oh, wow. All right. Happy Easter. It is good to see y'all's faces this morning as we uh, gather and we celebrate the resurrection of Jesus, right? So this is a great, great day. This is a day that we get to reflect on and, and find uh, victory in. And the verses that we read this morning, the first one, you're probably wondering, like, Second Kings, that's kind of, like, random. But I want to begin this morning by asking the question about hope. And that's a word that you're going to hear a lot this morning, hope. Hope and life, hope and life. And so I want to ask the question, where do you find hope? Where do you find hope? That yellow word, where do you find hope? We all find hope in a number of different places, right? We have like places in our lives where we know that we can trust in that and we can find hope in it and we feel secure and we feel safe. And so that question that I ask, where do you find hope, is so important for us because today is a day of hope. Today is a day where we find hope, and we find life, and we find victory. And the story of God, the story of God, of his people, is full of moments where new hope is found. There, if you read throughout the scriptures, and as we've been reading through the Bible this year as a church, you'll find numerous moments, time and time again, where there's a moment of desperation, but then there's hope that's found. And what we see in, in this passage in 2 Kings, just as before we kind of get going, we see this moment where there's a boy who's dead. And it says, when Elisha reached the house, there was the boy lying dead on his couch. And he went in and he shut the door on the two of them and prayed to the Lord. Then he got on the bed and he lay on the boy mouth to mouth, eyes to eyes, hands to hands. And as he stretched himself out on him, the boy's body grew warm. Elisha turned away and walked back and forth in the room. And then got on the bed and stretched out on him once more. The boy sneezed seven times and opened his eyes, and Elisha summoned Gehazi and said, Call the Shunammite, and he did. And when she came in, it was the mother of this boy, he said, Take your son. And so this is a moment that you see even in the Old Testament where there's like desperation. This mother's probably hopeless. She doesn't know what she's going to do. And we see a prophet of God. We see God move in the midst of a situation and bring about new hope. This is a moment of desperation to hope. It's a moment of desperation to hope. It's a moment where God brings about life. And this is also what we see in the life of Jesus. This is also what we see in the life of Jesus, where there are these moments in the story of Jesus when he's living his life and he's meeting people and he's with people. We see him meet these people that are outcasts, that are exiled, that are hurting, that are broken, that are shame-filled, that are guilty, that don't have any kind of hope to lean into. And we see them have these encounters with Jesus, and Jesus comes into moments of desperation and brings about new hope. Just like that, that moment where Elisha, God is there. God brings about new life. And what we are celebrating today is how God, in a new way, brought about new life for all of us. For us today in Jesus. And Jesus comes into moments of desperation and brings about new hope. And what I want to do this morning is I just want to look at several moments in the story of Jesus leading up to the victory that we find in his resurrection and these moments where Jesus meets with people that, that it doesn't make sense for him to meet with and it's moments that are kind of unexpected but what we see is a continual theme that continually happens that when people meet Jesus and Jesus becomes real for them, something changes, something shifts and something new happens in their life. And so the first moment that I want to look at this morning is a moment where Jesus is with several other men. 
He's been invited to eat with Pharisees, and these Pharisees are trying to figure this Jesus out. And they've brought him over to have dinner, and they're probably asking him all these questions about the law, about the Torah. Well, how do you interpret this? How do you, how do you explain this? And Jesus is there with these men, and they're enjoying dinner. And in this moment, out of nowhere, a woman comes in. And in your Bibles, this is in Luke 7, you might can see at the very top, it says, Jesus forgives a sinful woman. And this is woman's identity. Her only identity in the whole story is sinful. And what we see is that Jesus is there with these men. And this woman enters into this room as they're having dinner. And she just comes in. She's probably heard about Jesus. She's probably seen some of the things that he's done. She's probably heard some of the teachings that he's taught. She's probably heard about this grace and this love that he's offering. And she says, I have to find this Jesus. And what we see, even in this photo, we see Jesus and this woman comes and she begins to weep and cry and like profuse herself to him. And she is cleaning his feet with her tears. And she also has this small flask of oil, this alabaster flask of oil. And, and this was probably her most prized possession. It was probably the most valuable possession. And the thing about this woman is that more than likely what we can understand is that she was probably a prostitute. And she probably didn't live a life that, that she enjoyed. But she probably was who all of them thought that she was, sinful. And we see this moment where Jesus is there, and she comes in, and it's got to be awkward, right? Like, it's got to be awkward. They're eating dinner, and this woman just comes in, and they're like, what is she doing? And these men that are there, these men that are religious, they begin to ask the question, well, why would this Jesus, if he says who he says he is, why would he let her touch him? She's sinful. And then Jesus goes on to share this story, and he says, I want to teach you something. He shares this story where he talks about a debtor and a lender. And how there are two people that owe a debt. One owes a small debt, and the other owes a great debt. And then the lender decides, I'm going to forgive both debts. And he asks the question, who will be more thankful? Well, the one with the, the larger debt. And the, the, and the men answer the question, and he says, you've judged correctly. And that same thing is true for forgiveness. For those who have been forgiven greatly, forgive greatly. And those who have been forgiven greatly understand forgiveness greatly. And in this moment, Jesus says to her, Jesus said to her, your sins are forgiven. The other guests began to say among themselves, who is this that even forgives sins? And Jesus said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Go in peace. So this woman comes in with shame and hardship and hurt, and she leaves in peace. A moment and encounter with Jesus, new hope is found, right? The next moment that I'd like to look at is a story, I think, that if we have any children in the room, if you know the song, Zacchaeus was a wee little man and a wee little... Y'all know that song? All right? So we have this story, and it's one of my favorite stories in the Gospels, because we have this guy, and I relate to Zacchaeus, right? Okay? So Zacchaeus is a short guy, and we see that he's climbed up in this sycamore tree, and again... People are hearing about this Jesus. They know who this Jesus is. They hear about his teachings. They hear about the miracles. And they just want a moment with him. And they just want to encounter with him. Because new hope, right? They're, they're, they're hoping for something. And so Zacchaeus climbs up in this tree. And, and Jesus comes up to the tree. He, and he has these crowds of people following him. And, and Jesus comes up to Zacchaeus and he says, Man, come down. I got to come to your house. And here's the thing about Zacchaeus. It says that Zacchaeus, the tax collector... And it's so funny, when we see these stories in the Gospels, these people are defined by what they've done wrong, right? For the, for in this time period, the tax collectors were viewed as traitors. One, they were working for the Roman Empire, who was ruling over the Jewish people, and the money that they were collecting was going back to the Roman Empire so that they could even control them even more. And so what we see with Zacchaeus is that he is this person who is a traitor, and not only is he a traitor, but he's a thief. Because he takes these taxes from people, and not only does he take the certain amount that he's supposed to take, he adds on top of that so that he can make profit. And so Zacchaeus is viewed by the people around as this traitor, as this person who's a thief, as someone that can't be trusted, as this sinner. And this Jesus comes up to Zacchaeus and says, I want to go, and I want to be with you. I want to I know you. And we don't really see, like, this, we don't know what happens. Like, we don't know if Jesus, like, tells him what he's done is wrong. We don't know if, if Zacchaeus asks a bunch of questions. All we know is that there is an encounter between Jesus and Zacchaeus, and this encounter with Jesus changes everything for Zacchaeus. Because what we see with Zacchaeus is Zacchaeus goes from being this, like, tight-fisted, greedy, 
person who takes money from people. And we see a change in Luke 19.8. It says, But Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, Look, Lord, here and now I give half of my possessions. I'm giving it up. I've had this encounter. My hope is not in this anymore. I found new hope. Here and now I give half of my possessions to the poor, and if I have cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay back four times the amount. And what's interesting is in this story, if you go and read it, there's a, there's a moment where Jesus goes to Zacchaeus, and the people begin, they use a word called grumble. And y'all know some people, do you ever grumble, right? Grumble about people. So there's, there's this moment where people are grumbling. They're like, why is he with these people? Why is he, like, engaging with these sinners? If he is really this holy man that he says that he is, why would he do this? And again and again, we see these encounters where Jesus, time and time again, brings about new hope for people, brings about new life for people. And we see this in the story of God, that God is bringing about new life. God is bringing about new hope. And in Jesus, there's this new way to be human, new way to find hope, new way to find life. And near the end of Jesus' life, we see him take the ultimate sacrifice of bringing about new hope. And what we're celebrating this, this past week and observing this past week is the pain and the hardship that Jesus went through. And these people that Jesus was dealing with, I think the most interesting group that he deals with are the disciples. Because the disciples were the ones that should have been getting it. They're the ones who should have understood it. And we find this moment where Jesus has been crucified. And Jesus is crucified, and it feels like all hope has been lost. It's a confusing moment for the disciples because they're expecting Jesus to bring about this kingdom. How can we have this kingdom if there's no king? Our Jesus has died. He's gone away. He's not here. What do we do? And there's this moment for the disciples where there's this, like, hopelessness. And what we find in Luke 24 is we see, like, a moment where the women come and they tell the disciples, he's risen, he's back. And even in the midst of that, there's still confusion. Luke 24, 1 through 12. On the first day of the week, very early in the morning, the women took the spices they had prepared and went to the tomb. They found the stone rolled away from the tomb, but when they entered, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were wondering about this, suddenly two men in clothes that gleamed like lightning stood beside them. In their fright, the women bowed down with their faces to the ground, but the men said to them, Why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here. He is risen. So the women go. And there's this moment, and they see, like, these two men shining with light, and they don't know what's happening because they've gone out of, like, like wanting to just honor Jesus and, like, take care of his body. But they go, and his body is not there. And it says this, Remember how he told you while he was still with you in Galilee, the Son of Man must be delivered over to the hands of sinners, be crucified, and on the third day be raised again. Then they remembered his words, and when they came back from the tomb, they, all, they told all these things to the eleven and to all the others. It was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary the mother of James, and the others with them who told this to the apostles. And they tell the apostles, but the apostles still don't understand. They don't believe. But they did not believe the women because their words seemed to them like nonsense. Peter, however, he got up, he ran to the tomb, bending over, he saw the strips of linen lying by themselves, and he went away wondering to himself what had happened. There's moments here where the disciples are confused, they're hopeless, and I want you to really put yourself in the shoes of the disciples. Just for a moment, really imagine you've been following Jesus for three years. You've seen moments where this, like this woman who comes and washes the feet of Jesus and her life has changed. You've seen where Zacchaeus comes and he meets Jesus and he gives back what he's stolen. You see moments where Jesus has healed people, where like some friends have lowered a body down into a building and Jesus allowed this man to walk again. There's all these moments that the disciples are observing and they're watching and they're seeing. They've seen Jesus like calm the storms. They've seen Jesus walk on water. They've seen Jesus do all of these things and yet this Jesus is arrested. He's taken He's crucified, and he's killed, and they're hopeless. They don't have hope. They're confused. Even Peter doesn't understand what's going on. Where is this Jesus? Where is his body? His body was just there. I don't understand this. And we find another moment in John, in the Gospel of John, where the disciples, I think they finally get it. And this is one of my favorite moments in all of the New Testament, in all the Gospels, is that Jesus... He comes before the disciples, and the disciples are there hiding. 
Because what do you think that they're thinking? If their leader has been taken and killed, what do you think they think is going to happen to them? They think they're going to die as well. And so they're afraid. They're in fear. And we find this moment where the disciples are hiding in this room in fear for the Jewish leaders because they're afraid they're going to be taken and have the same consequences as Jesus. And this moment comes where Jesus appears before them. And I find it so funny. Jesus just appears before them, and it says this. On the evening of the first day of the week when the disciples were together with the doors locked. They were afraid now. When you lock your doors, you're afraid. For fear of the Jewish leaders, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. It's like Jesus shows up. Peace be with you. Be at peace. Be at ease, guys. All right? And after he said this, he showed them his hands and his side, and the disciples were overjoyed. There's this moment from fear to joy, right? And the disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. And again, Jesus said, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. In each of these moments that we've talked about today, there's an encounter where Jesus becomes real. Each of these moments is an encounter where Jesus becomes real. Who Jesus is becomes real. For the disciples, they were afraid. They didn't know what to do. Jesus becomes real, and in a moment, they were like, I get it. You're who you said you were. You're this Messiah, and you're doing things in a different way. You're bringing salvation about in a different way. We thought you were dead, and it says that he sent them. And see, the realness of Jesus, when Jesus becomes real in all of these moments, there is a shift in the hope of people's lives, where their hope goes from being in one thing, and it shifts to the next. The realness of of Jesus creates a shift in the hope of those who come to -to face-to-face with him. And the question I would ask you this morning, as we celebrate Easter, and we celebrate the resurrection of Jesus, what is your hope? Where is your hope found? Do you have hope in this risen Christ? Do you have hope in the victory of Jesus? Because for the disciples, what we see is they have this moment where their hope is in comfortability and safety, but it goes from when Jesus is gone, they no longer have that, and they're afraid. But then what happens when the disciples see Jesus? There's this moment where fear to joy. We see a shift in all of these stories that we've looked at today. For that woman... She went from being in shame and, and, and crying and going to Jesus to peace. We see Zacchaeus, he goes from greed and, and being like wanting to take from people to generosity. We see the disciples, they're afraid, and then they go to being joyful because the resurrection and the reality of who Jesus is has become real for them. And that's the challenge for us this morning as we celebrate Easter and we celebrate who Jesus is. Is the resurrection real to us today? And the reality of Jesus is new hope. You can find new hope this morning. You can find new hope on Easter Sunday, 2022. And the reality of the resurrection is new hope. And the disciples, do you know what they do after this moment occurs? They go. They go and they begin to preach the gospel. And do you know what happens to every single one of them? They die. Their greatest fear was death and when Jesus becomes real for them they are more than willing and open and okay with stepping into the thing that they feared most because Jesus had become real for them and a moment and an encounter with Jesus is what they needed to find new hope and they finally got it and has the reality of the resurrected Jesus become real for us today for each of us for you today where I asked that question earlier where do you find hope Think about it. Where am I finding my hope? Where will I find hope this week? Because Easter will come and go, but the resurrection is this continual reminder. It should be a reminder for us every day that we have hope in this resurrected Christ. And there's a quote that I love by a theologian. His name is N.T. Wright. And I'll leave you with this this morning. It says this, The message of Easter is that God's new world has been unveiled in Jesus Christ and that you're now invited to belong to it. Jesus is inviting you to have a moment with him. Jesus is inviting you to encounter his resurrected life. Jesus is inviting you this morning to encounter the victory that we have from his death on the cross and his resurrection and the forgiveness of sins that we can find hope, that we no longer have to hold on to the things that we've hoped for in the past, but we have hope in life today. 
much like these moments in the New Testament where Jesus has these encounters with people and their lives are changed, would your life be changed by who Jesus is and the reality of the resurrection and the victory that we can find in him? This is what we're challenged with this morning. We are invited into this, invited into following Jesus, invited into the hope and life that he offers us today. As we move into worship, I would challenge you to reflect and think on, where have I found hope? What does Easter Resurrection Sunday mean for me? What does the life of Jesus mean for me and how it's challenging me to change and to rest and find new hope and find victory in him? As we move into these next few moments, think about what Jesus has done. We celebrated this week like his death and his burial, but today we celebrate the victory of his resurrection. And that is something that we can find new hope in. And so I'll invite Austin and the band to come back up. And I'll be available here to pray if anyone would like to pray. Um, the altar is open for you to pray. If you would like to, to join in worship by giving, that is also open for you this morning. But I would encourage you this morning to lean into what Jesus is teaching us this morning. Lean into the victory of the resurrection, that Jesus is no longer dead, but he is risen. Would you pray with me? Dear God, thank you for your love and your mercy, God. I just ask that you would continue to show us who you are, that we would have moments with you that would change our lives, that would shift where we find hope, shift where we find uh, trust, shift where we find peace, God, that we would find rest in the truth that you are risen, God. Jesus, we thank you for your love. We thank you for your death, and we thank you for your victory and resurrection. Jesus, we pray all these things in your name. Amen. Let's stand and worship together this morning. Praise the one who made my
left a crimson stain He washed it white as snow He washed it white as snow May we continue to be reminded of the hope that we have in the victory of Jesus and his resurrection today. We hope that you have a great Easter Sunday uh, with your family, spending time together, uh, remembering what Jesus has done. Uh, God bless you. Have a great week.